this first section, um, we'd like to focus on the health and well-being collaboration team and the related performance elements to wildfires. And this, interestingly, the health part of this call was probably the most difficult to coordinate. So I was waiting to see who would end up calling in and we can um, kind of tool our conversation to who was on the phone and what um, people are working on and would like to know more about. Real quickly, um, I can talk about some related performance elements. I did a little um, search for fire in the IARPIC plan, and there's not really any performance elements specifically for wildfires, but there's definitely um, some um, intersection of wildfire to a lot of our performance elements because we are, you know, focused on general well-being, air quality, um, water quality, subsistence. So I pulled out what seem to be the most relevant. Um, and I will just, I won't read the whole entire performance elements because they're fairly long, but 1.1.1 um, um, in collaboration with Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, advance and support a regional One Health approach for assessing interactions at the uh, Arctic Human Animal Environment Interface. 1.2.2, um, um, also together with ANTHC, um, the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, Yukon Custom Health Corporation, and Bristol Bay Corporation support the health um, support research on the health impacts of poor um, indoor air quality, um, which you know can tie to wildfires. If you're in um, a household that is having you know smoke come into um, breathing areas, uh, performance element 1.3.1 in collaboration with State of Alaska uh, coordinate investigations and reporting on food security in the Arctic. So I pulled this performance element out um, because in previous calls where we've talked about wildfires and health, um, we have mentioned you know, that it'd be uh, useful to learn more about the post-fire impacts to subsistence uh, quality and also uh, water quality. And then as Ed mentioned, we do have another performance element that relates 1.1.2. In collaboration with ANTHC, supporting community-based monitoring and um, indigenous knowledge and local knowledge by maintaining and strengthening the local environmental observer network uh, to help describe connections between climate change, environmental impacts, and health effects. So, those are our related performance elements to wildfire. Um, because it was a little unsure who would be on the call for this team. Um, do we want to have a few people talk about some, if they are working on anything related to wildfires, just talk a little bit, um, you know, fairly briefly about what you're working on? How about uh, if someone from EPA is willing to talk about Smoke Sense app? I can talk about that. I thought that was a really neat tool um, that is really useful for some of these. Um, performance elements. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> um, so is anyone on the health side focused on anything related to um, looking at the impact of wildfires on human health? Sorry, Sarah, I was scrambling. This is Ed. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Back to smoke sense. Great. <laughs> so this is an app that was created by our folks at the Office of Research and Development, and it's rolled out this summer for the, the wildfire season this summer, and it's going to be around for next summer, too. They've rolled out an Android version, and they've got beta testers, and the Apple version is coming soon. And this is an app that it's in the, the, the area of citizen science, where citizen science can help researchers learn more about these impacts using a pilot mobile app and a crowdsourcing study. I'm reading this now called SmokeSense. It is the first of its kind to use a mobile app to evaluate the health effects from wildland fires and to test whether an app is an effective tool to inform the public about the health risks of wildland fire smoke. 
so it's it's using it to see what the the impact of the smoke is on the person it has some very easy to use uh boxes you just check and ultimately i think the, the researchers want to find out whether this modified people's behavior or not as a result of this and what they they collected in terms of the the sense of the smoke they they felt and and observed and so uh this will continue on and into uh next summer's wildfire season thank you sarah thanks ed do you happen to know how uh smoke exposure is being um assessed in this by this app is it just self-report I don't think they have a sensor. I think it's more of an observing or smelling themselves. They, that's how their, their reaction to the smile, the eye or, or um, I wish okay. I had somebody on the phone who was closer to it and knew exactly the details. But I don't, I, okay. I don't think they have a sensor because that's a separate exercise, a challenge that they've got in the works, which is a sensor challenge, which is, has been issued this summer to actually get lighter, cheaper, more accurate monitoring devices, sensors that citizens can use to detect carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, particulate matter, and ozone. Okay. So it's more about their health symptoms as, re as a result of the exposure to the smoke. Great. I imagine that down the line there might be some interesting discussions between, you know, what ends up being discovered in this app and maybe talking to some of the people in the other collaboration teams about how to tie that to, you know, maybe more specific ex um, exposure. Yes. We need to track the progress of this. So thank you for a little information. Ed, do you have a sense of um, how many downloads there have been thus far? You said it was rolled out this summer and, and how it's um, sort of being advertised to folks in, in areas that are smoke prone. Sorry, I don't have that information. Uh, I was hoping maybe one of my EPA colleagues would be on that this call that might have that. Ed, do you have the name of that person? Um, I had emailed her, but I can't search on my computer right now for it. Yeah, Christina Bagdikian. She's in RTP, Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. She's with our National Health and Environmental Effects Research Laboratory. And that's where that research is le being led by. Great, thank you. Hey, this is this is Randy Jan. I'm not with EPA, but uh, can I put in a plug for EPA? Sure. Um, uh, I was going to show you something. I've spent the last couple of months in Oregon, where we've had some pretty notoriously bad air quality and. It's been a, a big topic uh, in the news and a big impact on health. Uh, can I share my screen, Meredith, just quickly, if I press this uh, share screen button? Yeah, I believe so. Um, Sarah, you might have to stop sharing your screen for that to happen. Okay, I will stop. And okay. also, um, please put yourself on mute if you're not speaking, just so we can cut down a little bit on the background noise. Thanks. So one thing that's been very helpful for people here, I hope you can see my screen now, is uh, EPA's uh, new Air Now uh, utility. We can you see it? Screen. I can't. Um, did, you, did you click the share screen button at the bottom? Share screen. OK. How can you see it? Um, it's coming across. Anyway, it's uh, it's at airnow.gov. And uh, so, for example, here, uh, it's telling me my internet connection is unstable. So maybe it's now. exceeding yeah, my uh, bandwidth. Yeah, probably. Uh, stop.
Can you see it now? Yes. It, what I was going to say about it is that uh, it's very, very helpful for them who may need to, uh, you know, move or, or transfer because of health reasons to those sensitive populations that they can look around at different places they might go and see where it is. Gosh, you've only had that for a couple of years, if I'm, I remember correctly, from so uh, works uh, nationally. So anyway, uh, I think it's a great tool to help with. Randy, the, you're, cutting, you're cutting out because. I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, thank you for that information, Randy. How do you um, feel that that um, tool works for Alaska? Do you find it works pretty well? And there's a little less information in the remote areas of Alaska. And so to fill the gap, one of the things we talked about is the LEO network. There's a couple people on the call that are, you know, facilitating that, that uh, the uh, local observation network, and uh, that helps for some of the rural areas. Uh, I think the urban area will serve well. Right. Erica, uh, Mitchell, you're on the line. Could you comment about um, how Leo's being used for smoke prediction or observations about wildfire smoke? Absolutely. Um, so for those of you who may be unfamiliar, LEO is a platform to document observations of environmental change, um, and this includes wildfire. You know, we recognize that um, as temperatures increase, as there's a longer snow-free season, um, decreases in precipitation, changes in vegetation, and an increased frequency in lightning, um, we're going to see more wildfires, and we're going to see um, communities being impacted by that. So as part of LEO, we curate these collections of observations in two projects. And we do have a project set up for observations of wildfire smoke in collaboration with Allison York. Um, and what we have right now are some observations from 2014, 2015, and 2017. Um, that just document smoke from different fires coming into the communities, um, some of which have elaborated on the impact to human health. Um, this is something that we would be interested in, you know, partnering with um, some of these existing wildfire projects um, and, you know, really reaching out to people and introducing this as a tool to help document. Um, so it is available on our website now for those who would like to check it out. Um, you can see it at leonetwork.org, and if you hit the observations drop-down menu, you can see projects, and it'll come up if you search for wildfire. Thanks, Erica. Um, we actually have the ability, or if you are on IARPIC, you can post onto the website as well. Um, if you want to, you know, just reach out to agencies, um, anyone that's part of like the health and well-being team, for example, would see something you would post. So that might be a nice avenue to get a little more um, visibility too. Okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Hi, this is Mike uh, Brubaker. And I just wanted to add that um, our partner, you know, on developing that project is um, Allison York with UAF. And it's, it's kind of a uh, fledgling program. Um, we're just getting started. And, but we're, we're really excited about integrating a variety of both local observations, but also um, uh, environmental and uh, data, and also maybe satellite imagery. So I just wanted to kind of cue that up because I see Allison's on the line and see if she might want to add anything. Yeah, I did, Mike, thanks. Um, 
I wanted to say um, that one of the things that, I'll, and I'll post this link in the in the chat box, but one of the supplements that ANTHC has done um, really well is an excellent public education video um, about smoke impacts in rural Alaska that is really um, superb that I think should, should be, everybody on this call should know about and be disseminating. <laughs> post that link. Um, and yeah, I think that, that fledgling is an excellent uh, way to put the status of that project at this point. I think we're waiting for a big fire season. You know, we really didn't have, um, we, we were kind, kind, kind of up and running for 2015, but I think um, not, it, it, the word was not out um, as, as much as it could have been. So, but I think that, that we're starting to get a, a group of tools um, between Smoke Sense and Air Now and Leo uh, to get a better handle on smoke impacts at the local level. Yeah, and I think what I would add to that is, um, you know, the observations are starting to come in and we have a couple of historic ones, but we also have the ability to um, uh, connect to these projects and this one in particular is focused on wildfire smoke but we can connect to projects also um, articles in the news media and uh, there are a, a number of different um, articles from Canada because they have had a huge fire season again you know even Greenland um, and uh, other locations in uh, Western Europe and in Russia. And so there's a little bit of a um, chronology um, of the broader um, wildfire impacts and wildfire smoke impacts that are happening around the north. Mike, this is Tom Hennessy. When we've talked about wildfires in the past from a health perspective, I think some of the things that came up that would be of use for tribal communities would be information to help uh, predict where smoke is gonna be in communities to help in the response side of it. So people can, who are vulnerable can get into safe breathing spaces. Um, and also uh, predictions about impact of fires on subsistence food gathering or surface water from increased erosion that might uh, cloud or muddy water that communities rely on. Can you speak at all to the anti-HC program around fire preparations and uh, kind of the response activities and maybe give an idea for some of the researchers who are involved in the modeling and predictive side of how those data might be used? If someone's speaking, you might be on mute. Sorry. So I'll go, I'll, show, I'll give this a try and then um, Eric or Allison just chime in. Um, so uh, with Leo, um, you know, what, regardless of whether the topic is uh, food um, harvest change or, you know, uh, health of wildlife or smoke from wildfires, um, we started with two feeds of data, one being um, local observations and the other being um, content that is screened from news media. Right now we're in the process of working um, on a collaborative project with UAF, um, uh, Arctic Science Consortium, and also uh, NASA to find more effective ways to downscale to the community level uh, by community and by event, um, other types of data sources related to temperature, um, precipitation, wildfire activity, and as well as imagery, um, uh, webcam in imagery um, and satellite imagery. So we're hoping that you know, this goal of, of using a local observation to either um, instigate a uh, 
larger application of environmental data right up to satellite imagery or using satellite imagery um, to instigate some kind of a ground truthing based on a local observation and have it all live within the context of a specific community or region is what we're working on. So um, I think there's going to be uh, some exciting new features um, that will be uh, connected to these projects um, in the coming months. And um, and hopefully it'll be uh, you know it'll be more empowering um, both for people that are monitoring on the broad scale the impacts and people at the community level. Um, I guess I guess that was the main thing. I mean, as far as like how does this translate into actions that happen at a tribal health consortium in the north? And how it could translate into you know you know similar organizations in other places is that we are uh, partnering on a variety of different uh, research activities to try to um, collect and filter and provide um, relevant observation observational data to uh, researchers. We just did a project like that looking at the um, multi-year uh, seawater temperature, uh, high seawater temperatures that were uh, termed the blob, and there's a paper being published in that. Um, but, you know, we're also implementing uh, adaptation measures um, at the community level, and one example is that we have developed advisory um, papers that can be sent to clinics in communities when they're experiencing prolonged periods of uh, wildfire smoke. Um, as far as how to measure the level of wildfire smoke and using how to use LEO to uh, share observations about impacts. And then we're also uh, looking into ways that we can um, convert um, our rural clinics to be safer indoor air environments and shelters from wildfire smoke, which is novel in the north because the typical design for a northern um, village clinic does not include any kind of air conditioning system or the ability to uh, isolate the interior environment from dust, heat, or wildfire smoke. So I think that's an adaptation that's going to be uh, explored and more broadly applied in the future so that people, especially uh, people seeking refuge because they have respiratory issues, can go in, um, get, get inside and find some place where they can get away from the smoke to um, alleviate their symptoms. So I think I'll just stop there, and uh, Erica or Allison, if you have anything else you want to add, uh, please chime in. I think that was a great summary. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, yeah thank and you, Mike. Mike. Mike, this is Ed. To add to it, the eco component, what I mean by that is how wildfires also affect water quality because of the the watershed that and the ability of trees and, and their connection to holding the water, preventing erosion, sediment runoff into fresh water that might be drinking water and its effect on not only the drinking water but also the, the critters that, that live in that water area and whether they're a, a source of food for people that live near there. And also the, the combustion products of wildfires releasing what's accumulated in the soil. So it, it's in the spirit of a one health approach where it's primarily focusing on the health of people, but there's also secondary connections back to people through other avenues and it's the, the eco components, which I think Leo has a very uh, diverse network of, of collecting a lot of those observations about the environment. Yeah, I, I, that's a great point, Ed, and I'm glad you kind of brought up that angle because 
Um, you know, we, we do hear uh, observations about, um, you know, the absence of wildlife, you know, and a good example is in the interior with caribou. You know, the caribou are just like anything else. They don't want like the smoke and they go the other direction so it can interfere with their migration. Um, you know, what happens to uh, subsistence harvest areas, for example, with wild berries after there's been a burn and also, um, you know, changes as far as landscape with erosion um, because of the loss of coverage that's protecting the permafrost and then also increases in um, runoff of um, and, and turbidity levels in, you know, uh, rivers upstream from communities that are collecting surface water for the drinking water. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of secondary impacts and what we found is our um, emergency response systems are wonderful at dealing with the initial impacts, you know, and uh, and helping people to rebuild. Um, but as far as tracking and responding to the secondary impacts that may happen over the course of months or years, we don't really have very good systems for doing that. So I, I hope we can help in that way. Great, thank you, Mike, and uh, very interesting discussion so far. Um, I think we will um, pause on the health collaboration team portion of this call, and we can come back to it if we have time later on in the call. Um, we'll transition over to uh, some of the updates from the terrestrial ecosystems collaboration team um, and their connection to wildfires. Uh, after looking at the plan, it definitely appears that this team is definitely one of the heavy hitters in um, identifying work related or working on. Um, topics related to wildfire, a lot of different related performance elements. And Brendan, I know on your slides you have, your first slide looks like it has some performance elements. Are you willing just to talk broadly about them or maybe someone else um, from the collaboration team might be able to? Maybe. I was thinking, Allison, York could potentially go before I did to sort of give an overview of the, um, the, the context of fire and management in Alaska as it pertains. Mm -hmm. To, to the other uh, team members here, and then I'll kick it off after that, if that's okay. That's fine, is that fine with you, Allison? Yep, um, it says I need oh. uh, somebody else to quit sharing their screen. That'd be me, I'll stop. <laughs> Great. Okay. Hang on one sec. Okay, oops, I need to start from the beginning. Okay, um, it's distracting from the face and the blood. Uh, sorry. Um, so I just wanted to take a few minutes to um, to introduce you to this this whole team to who we are and um, what we do and a little bit about sort of the fire, the natural history of fire in Alaska and the the fire management uh, context. A little bit about. Um, what we know about how climate change is likely to affect uh, wildland fire in Alaska. Um, I, for many of you, this is going to be review, but um, I find that usually there are a few nuggets that are useful for people, um, and it does sort of help get us all on the same page. So I'm the coordinator for this unit at UAF, and I want to say thank you to Randy, who's, uh, who I didn't know was going to be on this call. She's supposed to be on leave. Um, for the, she developed most of the content for this, and there's an excellent uh, webinar that she uh, was part of, and um, Stacy Cooper from the Department of Health and Social Services and Martin Stufer at UAF uh, presented a webinar on the topic of wildfire smoke to the Alaska Center for Climate Assessment and Policy for their monthly webinar back in April. Uh, there's a lot of great content in that webinar. Um, so if you want more detail on any of these specifics, I would urge, I would encourage you to, um, to look at that. Um, so this is, this is uh, us, we're the Alaska Fire Science Consortium. Our mission is to improve collaboration between fire scientists and fire managers in Alaska. 
Sarah Trainer's the PI, I'm the coordinator. Randy, who's on this call, is our fire ecologist. And we also work with um, Robert Zeal, who's known as Zeke, he's a fire analyst. And we find that working with um, man people with real management experience is incredibly valuable for what we do. Um, our base funding comes from the Joint Fire Science Program, which is a small federal uh, agency. And they, about uh, 10 years ago, started up uh, these small, these, they're small in terms of people, but big in terms of footprint, uh, regional fire science exchanges that are uh, funded to work directly with people who are using fire on the land. Uh, the, the audience varies very much. Uh, from one uh, unit to the next in terms of who their audience is. For us, it is primarily uh, the suppression and jurisdictional agencies in Alaska. But anyway, every place in the U.S. is covered with one of these. These are incredibly valuable uh, resources uh, that everybody should know about. So now I'm going to focus a little bit more on Alaska. Just quickly, this is the um, fire history map of Alaska to show you that um, fire in Alaska is primarily uh, in the boreal forest in the interior uh, of Alaska, but it's not exclusively. If you look around, you'll see that there's fire uh, down in Southwest in the YK Delta. There's fire in tundra areas. Uh, if you look up, the, you'll see the edges of the Anaktubic River fire. Randy uh, talked about that uh, in her chat. Um, there's fire out on the Seward Peninsula, which is tundra, and in the Noatak. Um, the majority of uh, acres that burn in Alaska on an annual basis are in fires that are um, started by lightning. About half, half the number of fires are started by people, but in general, those are suppressed quickly. Um, and so lightning is the, the real contributor to acres burned. Um, oh, and I wanted to say also that that, um, that fire history map is probably one of the best fire history records um, that exists. And um, I think that's, that's a really important point for, uh, for people who are interested in doing research on this topic. This is a map to show you the um, management options for initial response to wildland fire from the suppression agency's point of view. Um, you'll notice that this map has a lot of green on it. That represents what's called a uh, limited uh, area, which means that it's, it's limited suppression. Suppression is only taken to protect specific values at risk. Um, where red, and there, as you'll see on this map, there's not a lot of uh, red areas. Those are called critical. That is where there's a lot of population and suppression is a high um, priority. Alaska managers, manages fires with a very well-organized interagency approach uh, that has been in existence since the 1980s. Um, local, state, federal, and tribal entities all work together in what is really a national model for fire management. Um, firefighter and public safety, of course, are always the highest priorities. Uh, but I think for this audience, it's important for you to recognize that our ability to allow many fires to burn in these limited areas with minimal suppression means that we're generally not seeing the problem that they're talking about in the lower 48 and in Canada of increased fuel loads. Um, and I also want to point out that this situation offers, uh, again, some real advantages for, for research in that we're allowed to, we are able to allow many fires to burn without intervention. So you're able to look at natural fire behavior and the management community here in Alaska is extremely uh, accessible and involved in research. Um, so they make great partners um, for researchers. This very quickly is um, the acres burned over time starting in 1950 with the, um, the what we call think of as the big fire years over a million acres. Um, at this point we, we think of about a million acres a year in Alaska as being our normal fire season. So uh, if it's over a million acres it's uh, in red and uh, you'll see that it's um, the number of large fire years is increasing, although of course it is highly variable. Um, but essentially it looks like the frequency of uh, large fire seasons has approximately doubled 
since 1990. Um, and Alaska is not alone here, of course. Um, there are big seasons in Canada in recent years. And um, so it's like the fire in Greenland um, this summer got a lot of attention. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about the 2015 season um, as our most recent big season. It was the second largest um, season on record, and we burned 5.1 million acres in 2015. And the major I really want to point out this, um, this graph here has uh, cumulative acres burned over time with comparing 2015 to 2004. 2004 is our all time uh, record of over 6 million acres. But if you look at the slope of this line, it's really kind of terrifying. Um, that pace of um, acres, acres burned over time is really remarkable. And it was really due to a extremely preconditioned fuels and then uh, extreme lightning ignition in a very short period of time. So that started to sort of give us a, a concept of um, a, uh, a, the concept of a sort of mega fire season. Um, so that was more than half of the acres burned in the US and that in 2015, that was the record season in the US. Um, and I, there have been a couple of uh, research papers about the uh, fire season of 2015 that I wanted to point out to this audience. Um, one uh, showing that the um, likelihood of a fire season of that severity was greatly increased uh, by climate change. That was in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, their special issue on explaining extreme events. And then also a recent paper in cl uh, Nature Climate Change showing that lightning was really a major driver of the recent large fire years 2015 in Alaska and 2014 in the Northwest Territories. Um, so that leads to a lot of smoke. Um, so here's a picture of um, smoke in July of 2015 in Alaska and of course smoke moves a lot. I don't have to tell. This is a picture uh, by Dale Hagstrom of um, what it looked like on the ground at the Fairbanks airport in 2004 um, when we had a lot of smoke in interior Alaska. That was an extremely long fire season. Um, they, as I don't have to tell this audience, the hazardous level is, is 300 to 500 and this was about a thousand. Uh, I do need to tell this audience that that's a it's a big issue, not just on health, but also for aviation. That was a huge issue in 2004. And it's a, that's also a big issue for management here. But because of the remote areas, our uh, fire management is extremely aviation dependent. And so being able to predict smoke um, and smoke impacts on their ability to move aircraft around the state is actually a huge issue um, for fire managers. Um, and I also want to point out that this is really, um, all of these issues have to do with our uh, fire ecology and what is the fuel that drives our fires in high latitudes, which is really um, the duff and the dead moss uh, on the forest floor, which can be, um, it responds extremely rapidly. It looks like something that should be nice and gooey and stay nice and damp, but actually it dries extremely fast, particularly in our long summer days. Um, it can dry out very, very quickly and um, it's all burnable. Uh, it can be up to 50 tons per acre in a typical black spruce stand. And then there's a lot of organic matter to make a lot of smoke there. We're also seeing longer fire seasons um, in Alaska. This is, um, these are two pictures from the 2016 season uh, showing a fire that was jumped in mid-April 2016. And then uh, a, I love this helicopter bucket that froze in October. Um, man, suppression forces working in really um, cold conditions because we're having longer uh, snow-free seasons. Um, we do have evidence um, for increased uh, smoke impacts. Um, I talked a little bit about visibility. This is a, a graph showing um, days with um, visibil visibility days and basically uh, the idea of every uh, summer with completely clear skies has really um, 
disappeared since about 1990. There are no more um, summers with no smoke impacts in Peru. Um, and this is just to remind me to, um, to tell you about, we've already talked quite a bit about the LEO network and its um, smoke reports from local environmental observers. Um, but this is a picture of the web page. I just want to, while I'm here, uh, put in one more plug for that video. I really encourage you guys to, to take a look at the link I sent. It's an excellent public education video. Um, so the, here's just a little bit about the modeling, and I think that um, Brendan's going to be talking more about this, but uh, there are a couple of recent papers that uh, show significant increases with um, burned area and burn probability over time um, in both interior, you know, basically everywhere in the, in the state over time. Um, there's also a relatively recent paper showing that we anticipate increased lightning. Uh, and that all adds up to uh, some work that was done by Lucia Wu at Yale um, to, to uh, predict that we would experience um, at least a doubling uh, or more of uh, PM 2.5 exposure by 2050. Um, and I think that's all I have to say, and I'd love it if Randy would uh, jump in and correct me, or um, I'm happy to answer any questions, although I think we probably want to move right along to, to Brendan. Yeah, Allison, thank you so much for all that information. Um, I think for the sake of time, we'll just move on to Brendan's um, talk, and then we can, if we have some time um, for discussion, uh, do a little bit of that. Sounds good. Great, thank you. No problem, happy to help. All right, thanks Allison. Um, sharing my screen here. Okay, so yeah, I put together a few slides um, uh, and in doing so, essentially focusing in on the connections between fire and then the atmosphere, of course, which transports the smoke and then the human impacts. And what I kind of know most about in that realm is is on the emissions side. Um, of course, once you have emissions, carbon emissions, then you partition out into different um, uh, constituents and species, then you can ingest that into models. And so I essentially wanted to um, give an update on activities um, that, you know, that I that I'm aware of um, related to that. Um, and so in, it's going to be a bit biased towards stuff I'm involved in, and it's also going to um, essentially all, all be involved with the NASA ABOVE program. And I assume most folks are familiar with that, but, it, but just in case not, it's, um, it's about a 10 year long um, program. We're in year, uh, just in year three now, um, it focused on Alaska and Western Canada. And there's, there's a lot going on. There, there are a lot of um, projects and teams. and. Um, but there are a handful that are involved with um, fire, um, and and so I've you know we've been quite involved in um, and uh, collaborating and doing things, um, which which has been great uh, to be a part of. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm going to offer a ton of insight on the individual performance elements themselves. I, I put them here mainly just because these are um, elements that all of this work ties into. So. So roughly 712 is about research and monitoring of um, disturbance, including fire. Um, 7.1.3 is about um, key geospatial data sets from remote sensing that again, a lot of folks at NASA are involved in now. Um, 7.1.4 um, models for integrating climate and disturbance, which is always a sort of critical need and being worked on by different groups. There, there's also some of that going on with above. Um, and 7.3.2, which is, um, mostly what I'll be um, focusing on, which is uh, emissions from fires and then the resultant uh, climate feedbacks. And then just to say within the fire working group, there are a couple main questions, but, but the ones that I'll um, really be touching on here have to do with the burning of the surface organic carbon, the emissions, and then a little bit on how the fire regime has been changing, but I um, sort of left that up to Allison. She did a great job of, of covering that um, from a bunch of different angles. Okay, um, so what I wanted to do first is just go over available products. Um, 
So maybe not that intellectually interesting, but just um, for folks who are involved in the sort of atmospheric transport side, maybe you know all about this, but um, so, sort of update on what products are out there now for fire emissions from the region, mostly focused on Alaska, but it will include some of um, Northwest Canada as well. So um, there's this global database, the, uh, the Global Fire Emissions uh, Database, GFED, it's been around for well over a decade now. Um, the fourth version, the data has been available for a little while, but the paper just came out, I think last week. Um, it's used by a lot of different modeling groups in the IPCC assessments, um, things like NOAA's Carbon Tracker, the Global Carbon Project. So it is pretty widely used. And of course it does cover Alaska. Um, there are a number of improvements in the fourth version and including um, we tried to do a better representation in boreal regions, but it was pretty much at a coarse scale, kind of North America versus Eurasia. So, so regionally, there, there, there certainly could be some improvements and it's also um, at a quarter degree, um, which depending on what the purpose is might be too coarse or might be fine. Um, what I'm showing here is there's a nice um, analysis and visualization uh, tool online. Um, this is just a screenshot essentially, but showing, um, well, online it's only updated to 2014, but the data is, is up through 2016 in reality, but showing a, a screenshot of the burned area in 2004. And then on the left, you can sort of make different graphs about the emissions uh, month by month or um, from different, um, well, here it's mostly forest, but um, you can do contributions from different land uses and things like that. And the data is all um, freely available and, and it, it's from 1997 to 2016 now. Um, and also I should say it's, it's burned area, it's carbon emissions, and, and they use region specific emission factors to get at all sorts of different um, species, particulates and, um, and gases um, that, that are of interest for transport modeling. Um, a bit more of a regionally tailored data set. Um, it's from some of the same folks who are involved with GFED and so the name now is ACFED, uh, at least for the first version, Alaska Fire Emissions Database. This is kind of a different approach. Um, so as opposed to the, the GFED, which is um, about a quarter degree, so roughly 25 kilometers on a side. Um, this is MODIS 500 meter resolution, so, so quite a bit finer, and it, and it really was tailored towards Alaska, although the model has been run over um, over uh, the Yukon Northwest Territories as well. It's based on a couple hundred field observations and bringing in different remote sensing and geospatial data sets in a, in a statistical framework. Um, but all of this, um, I'm showing the sort of two citations from the, the papers and it's all available online on the Ornell DAC, um, I believe uh, up through 2015 um, and starting uh, I think in 2001. Um, and just a few other ongoing activities I wanted to bring to light. I haven't talked to Tatiana Laboda in a while about this, but on the left there, um, for, for a pre-above project, as one of the things she was doing and her team was doing was developing a, a sort of multi-sensor record for fires north of 60 degrees. Um, so, um, you know, obviously most of Alaska, Northwest Territories, Yukon, and and it's not using not just the optical, um, typical optical um, wavelengths, but also uh, bringing in radar and doing a sort of sophisticated classification scheme. And I believe this should be available soon, um, but, but I don't know the current status. Um, and then Laura Bourgeois Chavez um, has some really neat products, uh, not in Alaska, but Northwest Territories related to fire progression and different land cover types. And, and if you're doing some work in that area, that could certainly be relevant. Um, and finally, on that side of things, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, for the atmospheric community, I don't know if this would even be that relevant, but we're, we're doing all of this on a finer scale now, too. So we're sort of moving to Landsat resolution. This is um, some work that's in, in prep, soon to be submitted, but it's basically Northwest Territories focus, but there's no reason we couldn't do it for Alaska. We just don't really necessarily have a funded project to do so. But um, but doing this analysis, this statistical uh, approach to modeling emissions using all sorts of geospatial data sets and remote sensing, um, fire weather, uh, things like that, to do it at a, at a 30 meter Landsat scale. And so here's just kind of a, a screenshot from that. We're doing this um, Northwest Territories fires in 2014, but you can see some, some nice sort of gradations across the landscape. And, and it's, it's really neat to see how it, um, how it is influenced by things like 
you know, properties that we know influence combustion, like the species that are present, black spruce versus jack pine, um, DNVR, topographic water indices, all these things. So that, that kind of resolution is really nice and you actually get a much better representation of how much of the landscape is burning too, as opposed to some of the coarse metrics. So I think, I think that's kind of where we're headed um, with all this relatively soon. Um, I also wanted to talk briefly about um, a synthesis effort that we're doing through ABOVE, although it's bringing a bunch of other folks in um, outside of ABOVE. Uh, and that is taking what we have in Alaska and integrating all these new observations um, across parts of Canada, Northwest Territories, Saskatchewan, even Alberta, Yukon. Um, and really what we're ending up with, so the, what I'm showing here are points that have, they're, they're, um, they're field measurements of combustion, but more than that, um, they all, all will, will get carbon emissions from the fire. And so what we're doing is building this database. It's almost a thousand burn plots now, which is actually the most comprehensive, I think, for any biome on the planet. And, and we're, we're trying to use it to answer some interesting questions about what are the major drivers um, of of combustion, we have sort of theory, but it but it um, but it might play out differently across the domain. And so this is just getting going; it's ongoing. But essentially, in terms of products for the community, it will also result in a, um, a sort of comprehensive modeling product of combustion that will will go across all of boreal North America um, and and you know hopefully be refined and even better for Alaska. Um, I also wanted to briefly talk about a project that I'm leading, um, and this is really uh, more focused, well, it has to do with carbon emissions from fire, but it also gets at that performance element of the climate feedbacks. Um, so we're, part of what we're doing is looking at the post-fire albedo, um, and this can be one of the biggest influences on climate. And, and if you really wanna understand how fires are influencing climate, you, ha you have to um, account for the positive and the negative feedbacks. And this is generally a negative feedback, meaning that the land surface is brighter after fires, mostly because of exposed snow in the late winter, and early spring months, and that can have quite a big effect. Um, so what we're doing, um, we've, we've been making some really nice strides lately is, is, is basically coming up with a much better understanding of what drives differences in post-fire albedo trajectories. You know, so on the bottom right, that's kind of a picture that, that most people have used in this research context with aggregating all these observations from all the fires across um, uh, you know, Canada and Alaska and, and starting doing a space for time thing. But we're, we're doing some machine learning and really coming up with a better understanding of what's driving this by latitude, by ecoregion, by fire severity. And I think that'll be really nice to sort of then bring back into um, a climate forcing type perspective. And then just showing on the left, there's, there's a product we'll have out relatively soon. It's a sort of daily blue sky albedo product. So it's, it's accounting for multiple scattering, which you get at high latitudes. Um, and and, um, and it, it, we think it's a, a, a bit better um, than the stuff that's available now, especially in high latitudes and especially when there's snow. Um, and then finally, um, related to the theme of, of changing fire regimes, I guess, you know, this was kind of covered by Allison. So maybe I'll go briefly for the sake of time, but, but um, kind of a neat paper recently um, really focusing on lightning. And I think that the, the idea here, um, well, there's a couple of take home points, but one of them is that when folks were, con you know, conceptualizing what, what's driving these big fire years and what's driving burned area in Alaska and other boreal regions, um, really focusing on the sort of fire weather component of it um, in terms of how big the fires get, how they spread, how intense they are, and, and even how many they are. But um, what what we kind of showed here is that the lightning component is actually really, really important to, to, to account for. And so, for example, um, the, the sort of second row there of those line, those time series graphs is showing observed lightning from a lightning detection network um, versus uh, ignition. So, so ignitions that then became fires. And you can see there's pretty tight correlation there. And then those ignitions um, lead to burned area. Another, you know, you can see the correlation there. Um, and then of course burned area to carbon emissions. And, and that's kind of the cascade of events that we're trying to show. Not to say that by any means that, um, that weather and climate at the time of fire is not important, but that lightning um, has a role that, that we really need to account for. And I think that we, we can account for, um, but it's also very related. The conditions that, um, that essentially lead to a lot of lightning strikes generally also are, are leading to 
other components that, that influence big fire years, warmer weather, longer growing seasons, um, and, and thunderstorms. Uh, and then finally, one of the, the other neat take homes from this um, was that, you know, if you see that panel there for interior Alaska, it takes a minute to figure out what's going on, but basically showing um, burned area and ignitions as you get um, sort of from the interior of the forest um, closer to tree line. And one of the implications, you know, essentially in Alaska is all in the YK Delta in 2015, but in these big fires, we're seeing more and more fires in the, in the tree line ecotone and tundra. And, um, and it could have implications for, for energy budgets and climate feedbacks, for example. We don't know, but there's a, you know, when you, when you burn more of the organic matter in these tree line ecotones, if you're exposing mineral soil, you could be, you know, having a favorable seedbed for establishment of more trees. And so in essence, you could be leading to forest expansion. And if that were the case, we know that, that more trees, they're darker, they absorb more uh, solar energy, they transpire more. They therefore have a positive feedback on convection and lightning and thunderstorms, which then could lead to more burned areas. So it's this kind of hypothesized positive feedback um, with implications for tree and potentially shrub expansion uh, and fires um, in, in these sort of tree line ecotone or even tundra uh, regions. So that's kind of a scattering of stuff that I'm, yeah, I've been involved in. Um, I didn't know exactly what was gonna be most relevant for the audience, but maybe there's some parts in there that, that uh, folks are uh, find interesting. Thanks, Brenda. That was definitely uh, very interesting. Um, I think if people have comments, we'll still wait until a little bit later for the sake of time. I really like to give our last presenter um, some adequate time to present as well. Um, but before we go into that, um, we'll segue over to the atmosphere collaboration team. And would um, any of the colleagues on the call for that for the atmosphere team be willing just to very briefly, um, you know, distill the focus of your performance elements as they relate to wildfires, just so that the group knows what you're working on? Okay. Well, this is Ashley. Let me at least take a first shot at it. Um, Great. The the um, uh, and and frankly, then I'll let Allison and Heist correct me. <laughs> but anyway, we uh, I, I'm impressed with the uh, depth and thoroughness of the uh, terrestrial teams uh, in particular uh, elements. We are probably not major players in the wildfire um, arena in our one element 233, which I don't have to project on the screen, I'll just have to read. It's kind of overlapping with some of the, uh, the element sevens performance elements. Uh, ours is understand the impacts of Arctic and boreal forest wildfires on emissions, distribution, weather, and climate impacts of biomass burning plumes. Through improved use of emission databases and chemical transport modeling, period, gain better understanding of the deposition processes through studies and better characterization of the spatial distribution of biomass burning aerosol. That's a mouthful, I know. But uh, the, I guess the Atmospheric impacts is sort of the ch portion we've chosen. Uh, I'm fascinated with the presentation so far, uh, and so I would say we're probably not the major drivers of this uh, topic. But but again, we're concerned with uh, what uh, what fire and the fire processes does to the uh, local atmosphere. Uh, Hi, sir, Allison. Do you have anything to add to this? I don't. I think you did a nice job in covering where we're at. Okay. And we've reported so far no progress. So I suppose we're that gives an indication that we're um, we're we're not as far along as the rest of you guys. How long will um, um, presumably have uh, show the progress we can claim? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a great segue um, for his uh, talk on impact of wildfire emissions on air quality in the Arctic. Ayla, are you ready to speak? Sorry you had to wait so long. <laughs> um, no problem. Yeah, I've been enjoying uh, Let me see. Um, I stopped sharing, so you should be ready to go. Let me click on this. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. 
Okay. All right. Uh, again, uh, my name is Hailong Wang. I work at the Pacific Northwest National Lab. I, uh, as Ashley said, uh, so this work I'm going to present is uh, broadly uh, related to the uh, performance element 2.3.3. It's about uh, aerosols impact on the Arctic uh, air quality, uh, climate, and the water cycle. So I, I made up this uh, title, but uh, it's uh, we don't have a particular focus on like the wildfire, wildfire emissions are air quality, but uh, what we, we do here is uh, broad, broadly related to this topic. So uh, you will see. So uh, the, the work we do here mostly uh, funded by, uh, by DOE uh, Earth System Modeling and uh, the uh, regional and global climate modeling programs and also some of the work recent work uh, was is supported by NASA uh, atmospheric composition modeling and analysis program so I uh, I didn't know that uh, the background of this audience but I just uh, borrowed some uh, pictures from the internet and some of my own pictures just as the introductory material for the uh, the white fire so this th this was the picture uh, taking uh, for the 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 recent uh, white fire the forest fire at uh, near the Columbia River Gorge uh, was pretty terrifying because uh, the right uh, the day the 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 fire started on September second uh, on on the Labor Day weekend uh, I drove we drove by there on the third on Sunday the picture you're seeing on the uh, right hand side is. Um, Uh, somehow I don't see my, it doesn't show my, I'm talking, I just make sure that it, it is me talking, right? Anybody? I can see your slides and, and your video, you're good. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, the, the picture on the, on the right hand side is, um, is the one I took uh, near the, the fire. You can see the strong, the strong uh, smoke. Uh, coming out of the forest, and uh, you can see the the dimming effect of the smoke on the sun. And then a couple of days later, uh, on the left hand side, this picture I took just in front of my house is like uh, really uh, on those the whole uh, week. The air quality was really bad. It was like the the predict the PM two point five concentration was over two hundred. That's where really see. Uh, here in U.S., and it was uh, in a very unhealthy uh, category. And also, you can see um, the this, especially you can you can smell it. It's like a very choking uh, smoke smell. <laughs> and this slide showed the um, some satellite imageries I borrowed from NASA website, showing that on the on the left hand side, uh, if you uh, look closely, uh, you can see some of the red dots. Those are indicating uh, the fire events going on on that day. It was uh, the top panels for September 5th and bottom for September 8th. So what, I'm, what I want to show here is that um, you can see actually closely, you can see the smoke uh, embedded in the, all the clouds here. If you look at the right panels, those are the aerosol products uh, with colors. You can see that those uh, smoke aerosols uh, can, can be uh, transported uh, for long range. Uh, on the top panel, you see the cross the American continent all the way to the high latitude to, uh, to the Arctic. And uh, the, the, the bottom panel, what, what I, my points to show that uh, on different day, uh, de determining, depending on the circulation, 
it can be transported to a different direction. This, the, the bottom one is directly from like the US to uh, Canada and all the way to the uh, Arctic. So those smoke plumes is different from those pollutants from surface. They can be lifted pretty high, uh, often to the mid uh, to upper troposphere. So they can uh, can uh, take a ride on like the jet stream, and uh, up there is um, not not much precipitation can remove them. So they can be transported pretty far away uh, from the sources. So here, uh, this slide show a very, uh, very high level sketch on our research uh, activities. So the overarching goal of our research in this, uh, related to this topic is to improve the predictive uh, understanding of uh, aerosol effects on air quality, uh, climate, uh, in terms of like uh, energy budget and water cycle, uh, including effect on precipitation and um, like seasonal snow, uh, glaciers. Uh, those are all related to the uh, Arctic. And uh, especially when those uh, smoke particles, uh, they have uh, absorbing components in the light absorbing components uh, in, the, in the particles. They can, when they deposit on snow and ice, they can uh, absorb additional heat and can melt uh, snow and ice. So we, the, the tool we use is the, the community atmosphere model. It's called uh, CAM5. It's uh, part of the uh, community earth system model. And what it is, it's a general, it's a global climate model with a pretty comprehensive consideration of aerosol effects. Uh, so what we did, uh, uh, unique uh, thing about this model, is we uh, implemented a uh, source tagging technique. Uh, it's, uh, it, it can be used to uh, tag and track emissions from different uh, specified regions and uh, different sectors. I'll talk a little more about a bit more about that. So this can be this tool can be used to quantify the uh, the amount, uh, the impact, and the uh, int, uh, var variability and trends of aerosols in the Arctic. Um, so we we'll talk about aerosols related to fire emission will be like black carbon, BC organic carbon and sulfate. So we can, uh, in the model, we can tag all those uh, different species and uh, different from different regions or from different sectors, uh, whether it's from anthropogenic uh, sources or from the uh, wildfire. So we can um, use this to establish kind of source receptor relationships then uh, identify how those uh, aerosols uh, originated from different uh, source regions can be transported to the Arctic. So this can also, our results can be used to provide guidance, for example, so how to mitigate the impact, um, not just for the Arctic, for other regions as well. For example, for the bad uh, air quality in China, if you want to improve that, where, where to cut the emissions. And also there's some also, um, we can do, for example, globally, there are lots of emission, uh, clear, clear Air Act uh, cut lots of emissions, like for example, from Europe, from US in the past uh, few decades, we can see how those impact the, the climate. And uh, the last item is about a project with NASA. We, uh, we compare uh, satellite observations to uh, to, to our model and to identify uh, emission uncertainties. So we all know that uh, emissions, doesn't, whether, doesn't matter whether it's anthropogenic or fire emissions, there are lots of uncertainties in the emission data set we use in global model. So with this uh, tool, uh, we can compare with satellite uh, observations then to identify uh, potential uncertainties and then uh, try to uh, develop better emission data sets. So this is one last slide. I'll try to very uh, briefly uh, showing uh, some of the results we get, uh, can get a taste of what we're doing. Um, so on the, this figure shows that the source regions we can tag. We, so in the model, we can define any source regions 
uh, as small as a single model grid or as large as a whole uh, continent. And uh, here I just show some uh, small regions where uh, tagging one of the studies. And uh, then this, those are the results that um, shows the recent decade average uh, source attribution of different uh, regions uh, to uh, sulfate concentration uh, in the Arctic. In the Arctic, so sulfate is a big contributor to, if you're talking about air quality, but unless it's like at some fire episodes, uh, other components will be more important. Here's just demonstrate that this tool can attribute uh, contributions from different source regions and uh, different uh, uh, emission sectors. And then one, one last piece of uh, information is about, we also did uh, a long range, uh, long term uh, simulation of the um, surface uh, aerosol concentrations in the Arctic. This is the, the, the mean for, for the whole Arctic. You see that uh, over the past uh, three, four decades, uh, the surface uh, particle concentration has been de decreasing, decreasing. And uh, we can, with our modern tool, we can uh, attribute those to different regions. See, uh, it can, in this figure, it shows that mostly it's due to decreased emissions from uh, Europe and uh, Russia, and also um, see the uh, quite strong contribution from the Arctic local sources. So, uh, so here I just leave some relevant papers we published uh, in the recent past, uh, just uh, all related to this, uh, to the topic uh, I just uh, described. Uh, if you're interested, uh, take a look at the papers and if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. Right, thank you. Thank you so much, Hylan. I There's definitely a lot of overlap with some of the other work going on, so it sounds like there's opportunity for some collaboration and some information sharing. Um, looks like Mike Brubaker had a comment for you in the chat box um, about some potential discussion of data sets. So that's just really great to see. Yeah, I, I, maybe I'll just, um, you know, uh, elaborate a little bit. So we're working right now <clears throat> um, to um, figure out ways that we can better ground truth um, wildfire smoke data to community impacts. Mm -hmm. And we're actually uh, looking for funding. So I guess I'll put that out just sort of as a, a general um, invite. But we're looking for some funding to support our software developer. We have a uh, idea of developing a um, sort of a web crawling software device to harvest images from FAA webcams, which are currently, uh, which are all over Alaska and Canada, but are currently only using the, um, uh, you know, it's, it's only a live shot. It doesn't archive any imagery. And uh, what we'd like to do is to, uh, in LEO, ground truth the uh, daily imagery showing what actual um, air quality conditions are and align the uh, imagery with NASA and other environmental, you know, satellite imagery so we could see the uh, comparison between um, and, and see sort of the time lapse effect of imagery that NATS is producing from its satellite imagery with uh, what's happening on the ground. So I think this would be a novel use of a really valuable, available um, data source. And our software engineer has a prototype already developed. And we'd like to go ahead and begin to develop that merging of data sets, which I think would be uh, great to talk with Hylong about that and see what he might be able to also, um, if there's any other collaboration, collaborative opportunities as far as interpretation of the data or use of the data. Great, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I know we all have a lot of information we would like to share, um, and this conversation I think could continue for 
quite some time. So that leads us just to a real quick top discussion on how we can continue um, talking about wildfire and health. Um, first, it was just, you know, do we want to continue this conversation? And it seems like based on, you know, the um, feedback from all these talks is that it's probably a great idea to continue. Um, continue, um, but, you know, we want to determine what the best way is to keep the the best way to keep this momentum going. Um, you know, do we want to continue to have um, collaboration team calls? Um, are there other ways we can continue to engage each other in this topic? Um, I think we might be able to, you know, through some emails, maybe identify a, a good way to continue this conversation. But I just wanted to have a few minutes to talk about this. Um, there's also, you know, possibility of collaborating at maybe a conference or just making sure that we say, you know, hi to someone at a conference that um, was at, on this call. Um, I do know that the terrestrial ecosystems collaboration team will continue this conversation, um, you know, more focused on their work on the 29th of this month at 10 a.m. So that uh, might be a good next step for some people who want to continue um, to discuss this topic. So, um, any feedback on things that um, anyone would like to see um, in the future? Any ideas on how we can continue to collaborate? Um, any research needs? I know we talked about a few on this call. Might be good to also um, engage on the, with the permafrost team. I know they have some related performance elements. So opening the floor. Sarah, Ed Washburn here. You said the terrestrial is on the 29th. I, I think I see it says Thursday the 21st. They have just um, rescheduled that meeting due to some conflicts from the team leaders. So, okay. yep. Well, my, my pitch is that this was such a great example of the cross the joint collaboration between three collaboration teams on a topic area that obviously has got a lot of interest, a lot going on, that we should consider doing another one of these and seeing how it can be um, continued. It'd be, hate, I'd be ter terrible if we just stopped at this point and said that was only a one-off. Definitely agree. <laughs> So I, this is Sandy um, Starkweather with the U.S. Arctic Observing Network. Ed and I had both mentioned at the beginning of the call that we're really curious about the, um, the observation side of this from the standpoint of the U.S. Arctic Observing Network. And of course, a lot of the information on the call provides the, the sort of context and the guidance and the, um, and the and sort of the impetus for why these observations are important. Um, I would say that in the context of US Aon, we would certainly be interested in helping to advance those aspects of the discussion that relate to um, the, the underlying observational networks, their relative strengths and weaknesses, um, their gaps. I was really interested to see Brendan's uh, work that included a lot of multi-sensor approaches because that's certainly something that's very interesting to USA on as an interagency body. How can we kind of draw together uh, the capabilities of the various observing agencies in, in multi-sensor approaches? And then of course, Heilong I thought had some uh, great examples of how you can then um, integrate these into more of a predictive understanding, which then reaches an even broader set of stakeholders. So if, if, there's, if there's sort of an idea that there might be multiple discussion threads here that could be developed, I would certainly put forward that USAON would be interested in helping to develop um, the thread related to the, the, the strength of the observing network and how, how it can be better utilized. Yeah, thanks, Sandy. I think that would be, that'd be great. Um, Tom, since you were, um, you've been in IRFIC for a while, do you know, um, 
do you have an idea of what might be the best route to continue? Is it common to have, you know, reg regular occurring collaboration team meetings or um, any thoughts on that? Well, I think that um, it's a newer feature of the approach this year and that really intentional approach to look for cross collaborations among teams. And I think the success of that uh, kind of depends on what the objective is. Uh, we had a really good informational sharing session today. We could do more of that. I guess what I'd be interested in is if there's some uh, synergies that could be uh, exploited from this. For example, um, Mike, Baker did a really nice job of some summarizing where the data are needed to help inform community decision making and response to wildfires. And so from the health side of it, the practical application of modeling data, uh, emissions information, and uh, just real time situational awareness, I think would be the, the useful application of it. Um, but as Sandy just discussed, uh, there may be other approaches just from the observing standpoint to find where gaps exist in the observation networks that really would not have direct health applications. So I think we'd need to choose what kind of discussion we wanted to have. If we wanted to have a health focused applications type discussion where researchers could see or look for opportunities to apply their data to real time response, or if it was really intended more at filling gaps in the observation network. I think those are separate conversations, um, but if there are people interested in finding ways to apply data in a practical way, I think from the health side of it, uh, we'd be really interested within the health and well-being collaborations team to, to set up a further discussion to see where we might make better use of data on a local community level. Okay, uh, thanks, Tom. I, I think that sounds um, like a good plan and it definitely is important to determine our objectives. Um, I do wanna be mindful of everyone's time, so I understand if you need to sign off, um, but I, perhaps we could propose for um, the health and wellbeing team um, to consider having you know, this meeting more on the observing side. Um, the other collaboration teams might find a topic they'd like to expand on a bit more with this group and then we can just use the features of IRPIC using the um, email or using the website to post some announcements just to make sure that everyone's involved. And we do have a list of people that were on the call, so we can just make sure that people are informed of next steps. Um, and we'll go from there because it would be great to really continue um, to discuss things with this group. Yeah, just to add on to that, Sarah, I didn't really finish my thought, um, but now that oh, you sorry. bring that up, I think the the collaboration team leaders may want to consider how this went and then when they meet together as a group to think about what would be a useful next step for their collaboration teams and, and whether there'd be cross collaborations that could help with that. So that might be kind of the next approaches to internal discussions within the teams and then reaching back out through the collaboration team leaders to see where we might do another joint meeting like this, uh, either through the Zoom mechanism or through uh, an in-person meeting. Perfect, I agree. So we will go with that plan um, and update people as we decide on things. Um, in the interim, if anyone has any questions or needs a con uh, contact name for someone on the call that didn't quite catch, uh, feel free to send me an email and I can help coordinate um, those connections. Uh, thank you again for everyone on the call. It's been great to hear from everyone and just learn a lot about um, wildfires and health and I look forward to talking to you all in the future. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Sarah.